Our first uh, keynote this morning is by a man whose name many of you will likely recognize. And I can say for myself, since in my work here, I actually spend a lot of time uh, talking to people about, about streaming and about Kafka and you know, trying to get these ideas into people's heads. And I find that one of the messages that is the most successful and that resonates most with the developers and the architects I talk to traces directly back to uh, our first speaker this morning, and that is Martin Kleppman. Martin, welcome to the stage. Good morning, everybody. I hope you're all well. I want to discuss this slightly provocative question, maybe. Is Kafka a database? What do you think? Is Kafka a database? I mean, some people will just immediately turn around and say, well, duh. Well, if you look at it, it has no tables, it has no data model, it has no secondary indexes. How on earth do you think it could be a database? The only thing you can do with it is subscribe to streams. And OK, I mean, that is, that is all right. But I'd like to go a little bit deeper in this talk and see what we can figure out around this question. So in order to do that, first of all, we need to decide what is actually a database? What do we mean with a database? What, what is it that makes a database a database? And for the sake of this talk, I'm going to use the following definition. A database is a thing that has acid properties. So some kind of piece of software that has these properties. You're probably familiar of acid from the world of relational databases. These are the properties that we want a transaction to have, atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. And what I'm going to show in the rest of this talk is go into each of those letters individually and see a bit in detail what it means and how we can use Kafka to actually achieve those properties. So let's start with the letter D, with durability, because that's in many ways the easiest one to deal with. So Back in the day when the, this acronym ACID was coined, uh, this was in the early 1980s, back then durability meant that you write your transaction log from your database to an archive tape. And that means that you know, even if some problem occurs with the database, you can restore it from this tape. Nowadays, of course, tapes have fallen somewhat out of fashion, uh, so durability got reinterpreted as meaning, well, we write to disk, we do an F-sync to ensure that the data has really hit the disk platter. And now, because this is non-volatile storage, even if you lose power to your server, you can expect the data to still be there on that disk. Fair enough. And so F-sync is part of it. It more recently has also become extended. The definition of durability has become extended to include replication, and that is not only do we want the data written to the disks on one machine, but we actually want it copied across several different machines so that if you lose an entire machine, you don't lose the data. You can just switch over to using the copy of the data on a different machine. And so well, both of those, Kafka will do perfectly well. Kafka will write all of the messages that you publish to it to disk, um, and it will replicate those messages across multiple machines. So the only last part to durability, I would say, is, well, generally, if you want to be sure that you don't lose any data, it's considered a good idea to back it up and to have some kind of backup and restore processes. Of course, you would do this with a database if the database contains important data. So likewise, if you have important data in Kafka, you would need to back it up. But that is an external process outside of the software that you set up. So with that, I think we can basically tick off the durability I think Kafka provides durability. There's not too much to argue around that. Let's look next at the A. So the A in ACID stands for atomicity. And there's a little bit of confusion around what this means, because if you're familiar with multi-threaded programming, for example, you get things like an atomic increment or so, an atomic compare and set operation, which are about concurrency. But the A in ACID is not about concurrency. It is uh, the concurrency is actually under the letter I. Rather, the letter A here, atomicity, stands for how we handle faults. Like if something crashes, for example, or if a server loses power suddenly, or if th things become disconnected from each other, uh, what happens in that case? So atomicity is about handling faults, and we'll come back later to the letter I, which is about concurrency. 
So the intuitive idea of atomicity is we want either all or nothing. That is, if a transaction writes a whole bunch of different things, and then something goes wrong, something crashes, for example, we want either that the transaction is rolled back, and so none of the changes, none of the rights that were made in that transaction take effect, everything disappears, or alternatively, if the transaction commits successfully, then we want all of the rights made by that transaction to become durable. And so this is the, what we want of atomicity, that is this property that even in the face of crashes, we have either all of the changes taking effect or none of the changes. So let's look at an example where you might want atomicity. So this could be like any type, any typical web app uh, where you've got some data that you've stored in a database, but you might not store that data only in the database. You might also have a cache or some, uh, some version, a copy of that data in a cache for, for faster access. And also you might store a copy of that data in a full text search index in order to do keyword search, for example. And so, you know, you might use Postgres as the database, Redis as the cache, Elasticsearch as the full text index, for example, or, or any other tools. And so what happens now if the user wants to change some data and different copies of that data live in these three different systems? So, you know, maybe this is a, an e-commerce site and you have a product catalog and you want to update the product description of a particular product. So that product description needs to be written to the database. And let's say you first write to the database and that is successful, okay. And now in the next step, you'll want to also update caches which contain maybe some kind of derived view or summary of the data in the database. And you also want to update the search index so that if people do a keyword search, they can find this updated description. And you can do this kind of thing, but let's say what happens if one of these systems is not working right now. So maybe the search index right now is having a bad time. Maybe you know, a configuration problem, or its disks are full, or it's disconnected from the network, or it's just for some reason got into a bad state, or it's overloaded. For whatever reason, the search index is not accepting writes right now. So OK, you've already written the data to the database, and you've written it to the cache. But now the write to the index is not working. So what do you do? Well, you could retry, of course. You could keep trying and hope that on the second or third attempt, the write may go through. But it might be that this service is just not working properly for an extended period of time. And so, well, you can't re keep retrying forever. Maybe a better option would be to try and revert the write that you've made. So undo it again in the database and the, ca and the cache where you've written it. But then what if other people have already seen this data and now you're suddenly taking away data that has already been seen by other users? It kind of gets into quite a mess, really. And so the traditional approach that has been, uh, that like research has always told the world what you should use in this situation is you want a distributed transaction. You want two-phase commit, which ensures that data is atomically committed across several different systems. So even if you've got maybe a database and a cache and an index um, all participating in a transaction, you can ensure with two-phase commit that if you uh, commit the, the, the transaction on any one of these systems, then the other systems will also commit. If any one of them aborts, all of the others will also abort. So you get the kind of all or nothing, which is nice in theory, except in practice, well, most of these systems actually don't support two-phase commit. The, if you take Redis or Elasticsearch as the examples, they do not support XA transactions. There's no support for the Java transaction API or whatever your favorite distributed transaction system is. So you simply can't do that. Moreover, even in systems that do support these distributed transactions, the performance tends to be pretty bad. The operational problems are pretty bad because it just takes one system to be running slightly slow, and then the whole rest of the system grinds to a halt. So it's not really great. So you might have heard me talk about this particular example before. And what I suggest to people is not, if, if you want to write data to these several different places, do not have the web application directly write to these three different places because that gives you all of these problems. Instead, we can use a tool like Kafka, and we use it as follows. So the web application, if it wants to write some data to several places, it does not directly contact the database. Instead, 
It just writes an event, a single event, that describes the data that it wants to write. For example, updating a particular item description in a product catalog. And it write that, writes that one event to a log, like Kafka. And so this is just a single event. Like A single event is either written or it's not written. No matter what kind of crashes happen, uh, you will never get a half-written event in Kafka. So writing a single message, a single event, can be made atomic very easily. Either that message is written to the log or not. And then the database and the cache and the search index that you want to update, they all consume from this log. They independently consume this log. And for example, the database will take all of the events that you've written to the log that describe what you want to write to the database, and they will take those events and reflect those writes in the database. Likewise, the cache, it independently consumes this same log, and the search index, it also consumes this log. And the guarantee that Kafka provides us here is that all of the consumers will see the same events, and they will see them in the same order. And we can rely on this guarantee now to ensure that any event that appears in the log will eventually be reflected in the database and in the cache and in the search index. And now, if, for example, the search index is temporarily running slow because it's not working, that's all right. The database and the cache, they can still continue consuming this log without any interference from the search index. They can keep, keep their systems up to date. And then at some later point when the search index recovers, it can restart its consumption from its last checkpoint, the last message that it previously processed correctly, and it will just go through the backlog, and it will see all of the messages. It won't drop any messages, um, and it will apply all of those to the index. So what we get here is atomicity. We get exactly the all or nothing guarantee that we wanted. That is, if a message appears in the log, then its effects will be written to all of these uh, consuming storage systems, but we get it without having any distributed transactions. So this is a really interesting idea. Let me show you another example, just a moment. Another example of atomicity. So like this is the standard textbook example that you always see of atomicity, which is you want to transfer some money from one bank account to another one. And so in a relational database, you would do it like this. You start a transaction, then you update the balance of the account from which you're taking the money and, for example, reduce its balance by $100. And then you update the balance of the account that is receiving the money, and you increase its balance by $100, and then you commit the transaction. And now, it's really important that these two updates happen atomically. Either both happen or neither happen. Because if only one of the two happens, that would mean that either you've got money that is disappearing into the ether, or you have got money that is being created out of thin air. And both of those are things that are generally considered to be a bad idea in, in financial systems. So generally in financial systems, you always want to preserve money, only move it around, but never create or destroy it. So here in this case, we want the two updates to happen atomically. We know how to do this with a relational database and a transaction. Fine. How would we do the same thing with Kafka? I suggest the following. If you want to transfer some money from account 12345 to account 54321, uh, what we do is we put a description of the transfer that we want to make in a single event, just a single event, a JSON document or something like that, and append it again to a Kafka log, to a Kafka topic. That is all we do initially. So this does not yet describe that the transfer has happened. It just describes the intention of, we want to transfer money from this account to that account. And we include some kind of event ID in this event, which is just some kind of string that uniquely identifies this particular event. Now we write a stream processor. This could be, for example, a Kafka Streams application. And what it does is it consumes this topic containing the transfer events. And for each transfer event that it sees, it emits two output events. One output event is a debit. It says, I want to take $100 from the source account. And the other is uh, an event for the destination account and says, I want to add $100 to this account. And so notice here now that these two events, they can actually go into different partitions because it might be a large system. There might be many, many different accounts. So what we want to ensure is that all of the uh, transactions that affect a particular account number all go into the same partition. 
We can do that very simply by using the account number as the partitioning key here. And now this will ensure that all of the, all of the transactions that affect account 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 will go into the same partition. Note here also that I've carried forward the event ID from the original transfer event. So this allows us to track the provenance where the events came from. It allows us to see that this debit and this credit event are the result of consuming that particular original transfer event. And now once we have this, we can have a second stage of stream processor. Again, maybe a Kafka Streams application. And it just looks at all of the events that are happening for a particular account number, and it maintains a balance, and it maintains a transaction history. And so the stream processor will just take an incoming event for its particular account number and see, OK, I need to increase the balance by $100. So it records that, and it records the ID of the event. This recording the ID is useful because maybe the event might get duplicated. So it could happen if the uh, first stage stream processor crashes that maybe it has output only the debit event but not the credit event or so. So you could get these kind of half-finished things happening if a, pr a stream processor crashes. But then, if, when the processor restarts, it will resume processing from the last checkpoint, and it will keep going through, over, through the transfer event. And because that transfer event previously was not completed, the processing of it was not completed, it will process that same transfer event again, and it will just output the same debit and credit events again. So you may end up with duplicate events, but, but for the second stage stream processor, it's easy to deduplicate those just by using the event ID. So in the jargon, we call this making the processing idempotent. Even if the message appears more than once, it just takes effect once. And then at the end, you can write the updated query balance to some database. It can be like a, a local state store within the Kafka Streams application, or it could be an external database. And this database is now being maintained correctly. It has exactly the properties that we want. It's atomic. So even if things crash here, we can be sure that if that original transfer event occurs in the original log, then the two resulting, credit and debit, will be applied to the two downstream accounts. But if that original event is not in the log, then of course nothing happens. So we get all or nothing. We get atomicity. That's all about atomicity. Let's move on to IA for isolation. And so as I said earlier, this is about concurrency. Now, in relational databases, isolation is actually a bit of a mess, and there are a whole bunch of different isolation levels that people use. But the strongest level that people use is called serializable. And the intuition bit behind serializable is that transactions behave as if they had the database to themselves. So transactions behave as if they were executed one at a time in some serial order uh, on the database by themselves. So it's as if there was only a single thread executing transactions, even though in reality you might have multiple transactions executing at the same time. So let's look again at an example how this might look in a relational database. Let's say you have an application in which users can create accounts with a username, and what you want to ensure is that the usernames are unique, and that is you want to ensure that there is at most one account with a given username. There should never be two accounts with the same username. And so we can achieve this in a serializable transaction by first checking, is there any account for the requested username? Let's say the user wants to re request the name Jane. So is there a Jane already? And if no, if that first query returns zero, then we insert a new row into the database saying the, this username Jane is now taken, and then we commit the transaction. And so this works fine if you have serializable transactions. Let's look at an example of the problem that happens if your transactions are not serializable. In that case, you could have one user that does the count and returns zero, because at the moment there's no username Jane. Then around about the same time, a different user, the purple user, is also wants to create a username with the same name. So they also request for any existing accounts in the database. They see there's nothing there. Now the first one, because it saw that there's nothing in the database, it goes ahead and inserts a new record into the database. And likewise, 
the purple user, it saw that there's no account for Jane in the database, so it also goes ahead and inserts a record into the database. Both commit, and now you've got actually two records, two user accounts with the same name, which is what we were trying to prevent in the first place. So this is the concurrency problem that can happen if you don't have serializability. How can we do something like this in Kafka? Turns out it's really simple, actually. So what we can do is we make a Kafka topic, which I might call username claims or requests for registration. And so any user, whenever they want to create an account with a particular username, they send a message, an event to this particular topic. And we use, in this case, the username as our partitioning key. And they send an event saying, I intend to register a particular username. This event does not yet mean that they have successfully got the username. It just says that they would like it, please. And so you might have these two users, both the, this greenish blue user and the red user, concurrently wanting to register the username Jane. Now, Kafka, what it does is it puts all of the messages that you publish to it, to the, all the messages that you publish to a single partition get put into a totally ordered log. And everyone who consumes that log will see the messages in the same order. And so of these two requests for Jane, either the red one will be first or the green one will be first. Let's say, for example, maybe the red one comes first. So now you can have a stream processor which consumes this topic of registration requests, and it keeps a little database on the side where it, it keeps note of which usernames have been claimed and which not. And so maybe the red user is the first one to appear in the log. And so then the stream processor will look in its database and see, OK, there's no existing user username, Jane. So I'm going to emit an output message to this other topic called successful registrations, saying red user has successfully registered the username Jane. And then a fraction of a second later, the message from the blue user gets processed. So it comes later in the log. And so by this time now, the stream processor, because the stream processor is just a single threaded loop that goes through the messages in a single partition, one at a time, it, by this point, has registered in, in its database, oh, we already have a user called Jane, so that username is taken, so we're going to output, output a message to this other topic saying, sorry, it's already taken. So what we get here is actually a serializable execution of this very transaction, and we make it serializable by effectively putting this logic, this transaction, inside of a stream processor. And now, if you have a Kafka Streams application, the stream processors are just single-threaded pieces of code that loop through the messages in a partition. So it's trivial to make this thing serializable because it already executes the, these operations in a serial order on a single thread. So we get serializability. We get very strong isolation between these things. And we can still scale to very high throughput by putting different usernames in different partitions. And so they can be processed on different threads. So by having lots of partitions, we can still have lots of threads pro busy processing these things. So we've covered atomicity and isolation and durability. This really just leaves consistency. And the C in ACID is slightly different from the other letters because it's not really a property of the database. Rather, consistency is a property of the application if it uses the database, if it relies on the atomicity and the isolation and the durability properties of the database. So typically what we mean with consistency is that there's some kind of integrity constraints or some kind of invariance that we always want to be true. So the example of a username being unique would be an example of an invariant. We always want at most one registration with a particular username. But you could imagine a similar thing being uh, in a bank account balance, you wanted to never go negative. Or uh, in, if you're selling seats in a theater or an airplane, you want to sell no more uh, tickets than you actually have seats in, in the theater or the airplane. So those would be typical consistency constraints. And we saw, like we saw with the username example, how you can implement those kind of things on top of Kafka. If you think about the example with the account balance, you can actually implement that in a, in a way that's very similar to the username example by serializing all of the uh, requests to withdraw from a particular account through a single threaded stream processor that just checks the validity of those requests. So I'm going to say here we can actually enforce very strong consistency properties 
on top of Kafka by building stream processors, which is really interesting. So I've shown that what we have here is we can actually make things that, that are not quite transactions, but using Kafka, we can actually preserve the atomicity, the consistency, the isolation, and the durability that normally we expect of databases. So does that make Kafka a database? I mean, you could say a different definition of a database is that you can query it ad hoc. This comic here did the rounds about 10 years ago when, like, at the, hype of the, at the height of the NoSQL hype. Um, and it, it makes a fair point, which is, like, sometimes you just want to do ad hoc queries over some data and like, just have it be, be uh, easy to query using SQL or something like that. And admittedly here, if you replace the word distributed MapReduce function in Erlang with distributed k-streams stream processor in Java, uh, then we actually have something that is, uh, that is maybe comparable. So I will take this criticism, but on the other hand, if what you want to do is ad hoc queries, this is actually really easy to do. You take your data in Kafka, you write it out using Kafka Connect to your favorite data warehouse, and in your favorite data warehouse, you can query it to your heart's content. So I'm just going to leave that to existing database software for doing ad hoc queries. What I rather think, what I've described to do today, is what we can do using Kafka and using these logs. It's a bit like having Lego bricks available from which you can build your own database. And the way we do this is we have to think our think you know, we have to change our mental model of how to program these things a little bit, because we're not really thinking in terms of transactions, but instead we're thinking in terms of these multi-stage pipelines with stream processors in between, where events flow through these several stages and get validated at different stages. So it's maybe slightly unfamiliar, but I think it can have very good properties. I think the reliability, the uptime of these systems can be excellent. I think the throughput and performance can be excellent. And we can actually get very strong consistency properties. You know, serializable transactions, there are actually a whole lot of um, distributed databases that don't even provide those. And we've seen today how we can do this kind of thing on top of Kafka. So that is why I find this a really interesting area to explore. And maybe if any of you are interested in uh, trying to build systems along this way, this way, I would love to talk to you and find out what kind of things you're trying to build and whether we can express it in terms of this log-based programming model. That's all I have today. I just wanted to say later on I will be giving out free signed copies of my book. Uh, I think we'll be doing that in the afternoon break at 3.30 down by the Confluent booth in the uh, exhibition hall. So I would love to see you there. But in the meantime, thank you very much for listening, and I hope you have a great conference. Thank you.